Good evening and welcome to our 31st annual Henry George Lecture at the University of Scranton. I'm Jordan Petras, the, the Chair of the Department of Economics and Finance. It's a great pleasure and privilege for the University of Scranton to be able to welcome Dr. David Hart, uh, the class of 1950 Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and Director of the Labor Studies Program at the National Bureau of Labor of Economic Research. Before we formally introduce our speaker tonight, I would like to say a few words about the nature of the Henry George Lecture and the Sackenbach Foundation that financially supports the Henry George Lecture Series. 130 years ago, a young unknown printer in San Francisco, Henry George, wrote the book he called Pro Progress and Poverty. Henry George tried to answer the question of why poverty coexisted with abundant wealth in his great classic of political economy, Progress and Poverty, which became an international bestseller. He also advocated that taxation of, on land values is the only primary means of reducing poverty. Henry had no real training. Indeed, he had stopped schooling in the seventh grade in his native Philadelphia. All he knew of economics were the basic rules of Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and other economists, and the new philosophies of Herbert Spencer, John Stuart Mill, much of which he gleaned from reading in public libraries. Today, Jordan's ideas on economic and social justice continue to inspire academics and activists around the globe in areas including the distribution of wealth, fair and efficient taxation, social justice, city planning, development economics, and environmental preservation. Our Henry Lecture Series wouldn't be possible without the financial support from the Robert Sakeba Foundation. We're happy to have with us tonight the program director uh, of, uh, uh, from the Robert Sackema Foundation uh, and board member, former board member of the, of the foundation, Brendan Hennigan, who drove all the way from Canada to be here with us tonight. Uh, also, uh, tonight he, uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have the board member, Bill Pat, who supports this event by his presence and participation every year. Thank you. As a newly elected board member of the Robert Sackema Foundation, I came to appreciate the interest and efforts of the, of the board to promote and disseminate the Henry George ideas, as well as to collaborate with the University of Scranton for that purpose. I would like to recognize also the dedicated team of faculty and staff in my department, as well as our ODE chapter, whose commitment continues to ensure a successful Henry George event every year. Special thanks go to the Henry George Committee, Dr. Edward Scahill, Chair of the Henry George Committee, and the rest of the committee members, Drs. John Kalaniotis, Satyajit Ghosh, Aram Balagizian, Christos Parjanas, and Jihan Kai. This event won't be possible without the assistance of our great administrative assistant, Ms. Ms. Janice Mekadon. Thank you all for your hard work and commitment. The Department of Economics and Finance continues to be the frontier in the frontier in terms of selecting the best candidates, excellent speakers for this lecture series. It's with a great pleasure to remind you that out of the past, past 30 Henry George speakers, four served as chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors, and nine have become Nobel laureates in economics shortly after they deliver our annual Henry George lecture here at the University of Scranton. And we hope this tradition continues to uh, with you tonight, Dr. Card. We will have the opportunity to ask questions immediately after Professor Card's speech. There will be students coming with microphones to facilitate taking your questions. Uh, now, I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Sajid Ghosh, to formally introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks, Sajid. Thank you, Jordan. I'm Sajid Ghosh. I teach economics at the university. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Tonight's speaker, Professor David Card, University of California, Berkeley. Professor Card is a class of 1950 professor of economics at Berkeley. He's the director of Center for Labor Economics there. He's the director of econometrics laboratory there. He's also the director of labor studies program at National Bureau of Economic Research. Before coming to Berkeley, Professor Card taught at University of at Princeton and the University of Chicago. He did his undergraduate work at Queen's University, Canada, 
and did his graduate work at Princeton. He was involved with uh, the editorial boards of the prominent journals in economics. He was a co-editor of American Economic Review, co-editor of Econometrica, two of the most prominent journals in economics. He was also uh, the associate editor of Journal of Labor Economics. Currently, he serves on the editorial board of Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Journal of Population Economics, and American Economic Journal Applied Economics. Dr. Card received numerous honors and awards. They're, they are really too numerous to mention all of them here. So I'll just mention a couple of them. He received in 1995 the prestigious John Bates Clark Medal, which is given every other year by American Economic Association for American economists under the age of 40 for their outstanding contribution to economics. Very often, the John Bates Clark uh, Medal winners go on to receive Nobel Prize in economics. He was also elected the Fellow of Econometric Society in 1992. Professor Card co-edited nine books, including some of them, including Immigration, Poverty, and Socioeconomic Inequality, Handbook of Labor Economics, and Myth and Measurement, The New Economics of Minimum Wage. And as if that's not enough, he wrote and published about 115 scholarly articles. David Card has had exceptional impact on empirical economics and particularly applied labor economics. Economics, particularly because of its importance as social science, needs to contain or elaborate on ideas that are relevant for the society, and in that regard, it must be based on proper empirical foundation. Yet for a long time, empirical work in economics kind of assumed a secondary role, primarily often to validate a theoretical model or a theoretical concept. Now, thanks to the work of David Card, his co-author, often co-author, Alan Kruger from Princeton, and other researchers, that has changed now. Now, empirical economics, based on rigorous econometric work, formulates testable hypothesis, works as a way to test economic concepts, economic models, economic theories, and at the same time, introduce us to new lines of research in economics. The work for which perhaps David Card became most popular and most famous was his work with Alan Kruger on minimum wage. At that time, the conventional wisdom was, when he was doing his work in 1990s, the conventional wisdom was any increase in minimum wage would reduce teenage employment. Professor Card and Professor Kruger, dissatisfied with the methodology with, that was used to arrive at that conclusion, which essentially focused on national economic data. They looked at natural experiment. By that, I mean kind of a case study, if you will. What they did, they compared the fast food restaurant's wages across New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania and studied the effect of minimum wages before and after there was an increase in minimum wage in New Jersey. Their work came up with 
An astounding conclusion, astounding because it was so different from the conventional conclusion at that time, that an increase in minimum wage would have very little adverse effect on employment. Now, for obvious reasons, people were kind of excited by that uh, result. But what was lost, perhaps, and however the discipline of economics did not lose sight of it, was that Card and Kruger, what they were creating at that time, was a new methodology for empirical research. Based on natural experiments, meaning naturally occurring phenomena, they brought up the ways to analyze particular issues. They came up with the ways to form testable hypotheses and how they can use econometric techniques to talk about economic theories, economic models. And that essentially now has become the dominant methodology of empirical economics and specifically applied labor economics. In the area of applied labor economics, Professor Carr had touched on every aspect of labor economics. His early work on union contracts in Canada gave us great insight in the labor demand side. And for labor supply, he did the path-breaking research using the ideas of immigration in the context of school quality and subsidized training that will affect supply of labor. He also looked at the models of strike, models of bargaining. So basically, all aspects of applied labor economics was touched by David Card's work. And by doing so, Card and Kruger and other researchers essentially made empirical research perhaps the front and center of economic discipline. Now, we would be seeing in economic journals about 70% of the scholarly articles will have all empirical or significant empirical content, which was not the case back in 70s or 80s. David Clark, David Card essentially changed the methodology of applied economics. And while he did that, he raised societal issues, issues that are of importance to all of us. This lecture series is named after Henry George, who dealt with the issues that are important to the society as a whole. Poverty, progress, and we have been very fortunate to have speakers in this lecture series who would enrich our world by bringing to us their research on and their concerns about societal issues. David Card, in his professional life, has always involved in issues that are important to the society. And his research has helped us to look beyond the cliches, to look beyond the misconceptions, and we are better for it. Folks, please join me to welcome David Carr. Thank you very much um, for that very kind introduction. Um, I was just visiting my grandmother over the weekend. Uh, I wish she <laughs> could hear about that. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, a very distinguished list of uh, previous speakers. And uh, it's an opportunity for me to sp speak to an audience of, of younger people who uh, are going to go out in the world and hopefully uh, uh, make an influence in the future uh, of the country. Uh, and I'm going to try and talk today about uh, immigration uh, issues. And um, 
as we all know, this is a somewhat controversial issue. Uh, and I'm going to try and talk uh, mostly about um, research that I've done and others have done uh, on the kind of economic aspects of immigration. Towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, additional work that I've done um, trying to understand a slightly different question uh, about how people uh, come to have the views that they have about uh, immigration. And I'll, I'll try and put that in context, uh, and maybe that will be helpful in thinking a little bit about uh, why this is such a controversial issue. Um, so just by way of background, and when you're speaking about immigration, uh, I think it's really important, and this is a, a point that when we're thinking about virtually any public policy in the United States these days, and, and several other countries in, in addition, including my home country, Canada, um, there's really been relatively slow progress in uh, wage growth for uh, quite a few decades now. Uh, this is a graph that shows the median earnings of full-time, full-year male and female workers st starting in the uh, early 1960s when the Census Bureau first started to collect this information from its annual survey. And uh, the, the amounts are in real dollars, so it's adjusted for today's price level. Uh, and you can see kind of a surprising feature here. Uh, focus first on the men. Now, these are people who had no unemployment last year and worked at least 40 hours a week. So this is not because of unemployment or anything like that. This is trying to adjust for that. And you can see that after about the early 1970s, there are essentially constant level of wages. And uh, if that's, uh, I want to keep, you keep that in mind. I, I would point out that I got to graduate school around here uh, in the late 70s. And at that time, we thought, well, we've had a stop. We've had a, a few years of bad times. It's the, great, it's the uh, oil price increases. It's the uh, you know, temporary recession. And we'll get back on track. And if you see what had been going on before, there had been a pretty steady trend. And actually, that trend went all the way back to uh, the end of World War II. So there was this period before that, uh, 1970s, where we thought that every year, uh, each additional year, there would be something like a couple of percentage points of growth. And as economists, most of you are economists or economics majors, you know that even a couple of percentage points of a year of growth in 20 years puts you a long way ahead. Uh, but that stopped. And for women, there was uh, some gains. In fact, pretty important gains. Uh, you can see the gap between males and females uh, has actually narrowed quite a bit. Oftentimes, uh, when people are speaking of this gap, they mention the fact that in the Bible, it's mentioned that women and men have a certain earnings ratio uh, that was about the ratio that we had in 1960s, two thirds. But nowadays, it's much closer, especially for full-time workers, although still not equal. And you can see there is kind of a disturbing feature here, which sometime in the 2000s, women stopped growing as well. Uh, and so that's kind of a motivating factor. And you might ask uh, what that means. Uh, I pointed out here on the slide that when we have this long period of stagnant growth, it means that a typical person in their 20s, 30s, or 40s is on average no better off than their parents. And uh, that is really contrary to the, what we would think of as the American dream, or uh, the Canadian dream, as far as that goes. So if, on average, people are about as well off as their parents, it means like something like half are worse off than their parents which is actually a very different picture than we have. And so people are led to ask, what went wrong? Did something go wrong in the US labor market? Was it technology? Was it international trade? Or was it immigration? Uh, and you can see discussions around uh, the current political campaign on all three of those issues. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about immigration. And just to set the stage, why that might be a plausible thing to worry about. This is a graph that shows the fraction of the US population who are first generation immigrants, this is the dark blue, and second generation. That means that at least one of your parents was born outside the United States. Uh, and you can see in the, around 1900, we were at around 15% first generation and, and another 20% second generation. And that was reflecting the long, long history of immigration up to uh, around World War I. Now, starting in uh, 1926, there was a major reform in immigration law. And then during the period of the Great Depression, uh, mobility patterns around the world really came to a halt. And so uh, there really was very, very slow immigration all the way into the early 1960s. And so many of people of my generation grew up in an era where the number of immigrants was actually quite low. You can see in 1965, uh, 
when I was uh, um, starting school and the Beatles came to America, it was about 5% immigrants. Uh, and a little bit higher fraction than that second gens, second generation, but many of those second gens were by then quite old. Then what happened? Well, we had a series of changes in US immigration law and also a general opening up of migration patterns around the world. So this is not just the US that you would see these patterns. You would see these patterns in Canada, Australia, uh, many other countries. Uh, and so now we're back to the level of immigration around here. We're back to almost the level that we had in the beginning of the century. And the second generation is also growing quickly. In a place like California, more than a half of the children in schools now are either immigrants or second generation. So this is a phenomenon that's going on. And you might say, well, something happened here. We see an increasing number of immigration of immigrants after about 1990. Maybe that contributed to the trend. And so that's the cause, I think, of concern about immigration. And I don't think it does anybody any good to not admit, first of all, that there isn't a problem in the labor market, for, uh, especially for American men, but uh, more recently, probably also for women, and that uh, you could easily make a simple case that it's correlated with immigration. And as we know, in many circles, uh, correlation equals causality. Now, hopefully, in, in you know, more sophisticated analysis, that's not the case, but it's, it's often tempting. So what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to quickly go through some background facts and trends, uh, sort of framing what we know about immigration. I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of immigrants come to the United States and why, to some extent. And of course, being an economist, I can't resist saying that it's all supply and demand. Um, then I'll talk about how we should think about the uh, economics of labor market uh, impacts, and I'll try and convince you uh, that it might be a little bit different than the way uh, you would hear in a very simple-minded uh, analysis. Uh, then I'll talk about the evidence that's been accumulating, and then finally I'll come back and talk about what does the general public think about immigration, and how should we put this evidence on economics into that framework. Um, okay. So how many immigrants do we have? You can see this is the data for 2000 and 2015, just to kind of frame things. The number of immigrants is now about 40 million. We have got around 14% of the immigrant population is, um, are born outside the US. And by immigrants, I mean someone born outside the US, not in uh, countries that are uh, where you automatically get US citizenship, so not in Guam, for example. Uh, and you can see another feature that is pretty important. It's around a quarter of all those immigrants are unauthorized. Uh, so that means that they have come to the US and overstayed a visa, in most cases, and are working, uh, or not working, but uh, largely working without authorized documents. Uh, so that's a fairly significant fraction. The top source countries of uh, US immigration, the largest source country by far is Mexico. Uh, the next uh, biggest group is India, Philippines, and China are uh, fairly similar, and this data is a, a little bit out of date. I think right now China has recently passed the Philippines. Um, Vietnam is another fairly important source, and other big source countries are El Salvador, Cuba, and Korea. Uh, notice one thing right away. Uh, there's uh, no countries on that list that are kind of white European. A long time ago, the major list would have included Canada. Canada was one of the major sources of immigrants to the United States. Um, Britain the UK, uh, Italy, and uh, many other European countries. In the beginning of the century, most of the immigrants came from uh, Central Europe, Hungary, uh, on east into Russia. Uh, so this has really changed a lot. And that's important also to recognize. So a lot of these people are not going to look exactly like uh, the typical member of Congress. Uh, and so that's important to think about. And I'll, I'll come back and, and talk about that later on. Another way that immigrants are different uh, than natives is an educational structure. So this is a tabulation that shows um, for four different groups. This is natives, all immigrants as a whole, Hispanic immigrants, so that would be uh, people from Mexico as well as Central and South America, and then Southeast, Southeast Asian immigrants, uh, which is a um, pretty large group. And you can see I've, I've categorized everyone by their education level. Dropout means you didn't finish high school. And in the native population, that's only 11%. Now, it's been 11% for 30 years in the US. So you might say that's pretty good, but it isn't actually that good. We should be lower than that. Most European countries are below that. Uh, among all immigrants, it's 32%. So instead of a tenth, it's a third of all immigrants. And among 
the Hispanic immigrants is a half. So you can see, at all, or again, this really big difference between the immigrant group, especially that one immigrant group. Uh, it's also relatively high, maybe surprising to some of you, how high it is amongst the Southeast Asians. And that's because that's a very heterogeneous group. It includes, on the one hand, Indian immigrants, which are the most educated group of immigrants in the country, and also by far better educated than Americans, and uh, as well as immigrants from Vietnam and Philippines, who are, on average, a little bit uh, below uh, the, the level of natives. Okay? High school graduate is a relatively common category. So that's people that have 12th grade and no completed formal education beyond that. So that's around a third of natives. It's only about uh, a fifth of immigrants. Uh, and that's because that particular category is not, but we'll talk about why that is exactly. In the sub-college ratio, this is people that have between one and four years of college. So this is a, like your roommate who is no longer with us, uh, as, well as, as well as your uh, screwed up uh, older brother who uh, went to college for a couple of years and never told your mom that he dropped out until the end of the third year. Uh, so that kind of crowd. So that's a pretty big group of Americans. So you can see these two groups is 60%. That's only 20% here. And then when we get to the BA or more or advanced degree, you can see that the immigrants are catching back up. So the immigrant group is about 28% with the BA or higher versus 29 native. Amongst the Southeast Asians, it's almost a half. Okay, now partially why is that? Well, as anybody who, who's here who's of Indian ancestry will know, the only way you can get in the United States from a huge country like India is if you have a master's degree or above. Basically, that's our policy for that. And a similar policy, not quite as restrictive for many other countries. So amongst uh, the Southeast Asian group, 21% have an advanced degree, master's or above. Okay, So you can see there's a very important set of differences here. On the one hand, the immigrant groups, on average, have about the same fraction with a bachelor's degree or above, but more concentrated at the very high end. And then on the other hand, very heavily concentrated at the low end as well. So there's a lot of other differences. Immigrants are clustered in certain cities and states. Uh, this is no shock to most of you, I'm sure. Uh, cities like Los Angeles and Miami are over 50% immigrants. Uh, the big international cities with high immigrant fractions would include Los Angeles and Miami, as well as Toronto, Vancouver, Sydney, Auckland, uh, and London, England, where you're between 40 and 55% immigrants in those cities. New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco are around the 20 to 30% immigrant range. Remember, the national average is about 14. <laughs> Pittsburgh, Cleveland, a lot of uh, middle country, uh, middle of the country cities, Atlanta would be in this category, uh, are under 10%, and some of those are as low as 5%. And then many rural areas are 2 to 5%. So you can see enormous heterogeneity. If you live in New York City or you live in Los Angeles, you think that everybody's an immigrant. If you teach at the University of California, Berkeley, you're sure of it. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in a, a rural part of uh, Pennsylvania, you might think that there's not very many immigrants here. There's someplace else. Okay? Immigrants are also clustered in jobs. Agriculture and food processing are uh, nowadays up to 50% immigrants. Uh, I, I have a, a relatively good friend, a colleague in the uh, uh, anthropology department who spent his whole life studying uh, agricultural workers in California. And his way of putting it, he's Mexican-American, to say Mexicans own agriculture. They basically, that's, that's who does the work in that sector. Healthcare is also one that's very important. Uh, I'm sure in, in, this, in this area, many, many of the immigrant, uh, many, many of the doctors and nurses are, for, are foreign born. And that's pretty common. Okay. So why is that? Why do we get this bifurcation of the types of immigrants? Well, there's sort of on the, on the supply side two things to think about. If you're from a rich country, like Canada, why would you want to come to the United States? Well, on average, if you're going to earn kind of middle or low income, this is not the country for you. This country has relatively low benefits, uh, and it's a bit risky. You lose your job, you lose your health care. Um, so this is not the country for a middle performer. This is actually a country for high performers. People who are convinced they're going to be at the high end will want to come to the US. We've got low taxes relative to most other countries. And also a very big upper tail, which you're hearing about all the time. The top 1% is well over you know, half a million dollars a year and things like that. So this is a country for the very high end. And that's, a, I think, a very positive feature of US immigration. It's a lot of people who are striving for that. Okay? They want the money. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, for poor countries, many, many people would like to come to the US, So, at least in an economic sense. 
if they would make more here than they could ever make at home across the board. However, at the lowest end, that gap is enormous. So the gap between what an unskilled worker can earn in India or, and, the, and what they could earn in the United States is just unbelievably huge, 20 or 30 to 1. So that means that we're going to have economic incentives for high-skilled workers from some countries and lower-skilled workers for other countries. On the other hand, our immigration policy is going to essentially open venues for uh, different types of groups. So at the high-skilled end, H-1B program, that's where you've got to have a master's or more. Family-based immigration is more generous. Eventually, you can get in independent of your education qualifications. We've got low-skill demand, so there's an H-2A program for agricultural workers uh, and other programs like that, as well as, remember, that quarter of immigrants are coming in undocumented. Now, virtually all of those are at the low end. So that's kind of how to think about the, the one side. This is very different than other countries. Uh, our, com our competition in the world market for talent is Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And you can see uh, that those countries have a policy which on paper, at least, looks like it's much more favorable toward highly skilled workers. Nevertheless, I was recently at a conference in Ottawa, and they were comparing these exact four countries. At the very high end, US immigrants do much better than immigrants to any of these countries. So the draw of the low taxes and the high uh, upper tail of income prospects is still a very powerful draw. On the demand side, uh, what, do we, what can we say? Well, at the top of the skill distribution, there's a couple of things that are very important and salient. One thing is that it seems pretty clear to economists for the last several decades that there's been steadily increasing demand for highly educated workers. So the country seems to be able to absorb lots of highly educated workers. There seems to be plenty of things that they can do. On the other side of that equation, our own domestic uh, education system has not done a particularly good job. So the fraction of children who come after finishing high school who go on and finish a bachelor's degree, although it's higher today than it was in the 70s, it's surprisingly not much higher, especially for men. And many of you will know there's a lot of concern about why are uh, men having such a hard time getting through college. If you look around at your college uh, dorm, you'll notice that this is, it's like 60% female on a typical college campus in the US. Those problems are also shared in many other uh, Western countries. So there's, we're, many, uh, many countries are, are doing a bad job of educating men. So that, that, for whatever reason, there has been a sort of a slowdown. That wasn't the case in, in 1970. In 1970, the typical graduate coming from a college was male. It was 60, 40 the other way. So something has happened, and, and part of it is definitely there's evidence that it was due to the lack of investment in the public education system. Uh, in many states around the country. There's a particular shortfall in the science, technology, engineering, and math area. You'll hear, or you've heard, I'm sure, lots of discussion about the STEM area. And that's an area where uh, the US does not seem to be uh, having a, much of an advantage. Uh, basically, if you test kids at the end of high school in our country versus other countries, you'll see we don't do so well. Our upper end, our very top two or three percent are you know, the best in the world. But our kind of middle high school graduate is not too good in math and not very good in science. Uh, and you know everybody kind of knows that. So we kind of need to get those people in here if we're going to actually engineer anything. Uh, so that's the demand side. On the bottom, there's sort of a different set of factors. Uh, and one thing that's important is, as an economist, I've, I've raised this a number of times, and it sometimes goes over and other times not. I think of the US as a country which has high demand for low-skilled workers and institutions that are very adaptive to that. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a high demand for low-wage workers because many women work, and there's demand for daycare. And we have very informal daycare. So we, we put up with a daycare system where the typical daycare uh, provider is actually a relatively poorly educated immigrant. Uh, there's also a lot of demand for informal health care. So this would be home health care for uh, People are a little bit infirm, and that's largely supplied by uh, lower educated immigrant women. Similarly, in agriculture, uh, construction, many other areas of the US economy, we've got lots and lots of possibilities for low skilled workers. We basically use low skilled workers fairly effectively. We run a, a different kind of construction for, how, say, home construction than you would in Europe, where everybody on the job site has three years of college training. Uh, on the other side, and related to that, we have these very flexible institutions like subcontracting, 
You might wonder, how are six million Ill illegal workers working in the United States? How can that possibly be? It's not that easy. Largely, it's through things like subcontracting institutions, which allow a, a chain of employers to hire each other until we get down to the bottom, where the last guy is hiring undocumented workers. And that's very common in the construction industry. There's also a pretty high tolerance for that. So especially, for instance, in California, everybody is pretty much aware that this is going on. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly before 9-11, it was very widespread and, and much more tolerated. But even today, it's, it's uh, relatively highly tolerated. So this supply and demand setting says that both from the point of view of who wants to come and from the point of view of our legal system, the visas and so on, and from the point of view of our institutions, for example, high tolerance for undocumented workers and ability to hire them despite the absence of documentation, it means that we get a kind of a weird combination of high-skilled and low-skilled immigrants. On the one side, we get very highly educated Asians and Europeans uh, in healthcare and in academia and uh, engineering and software. On the other end, we get lots and lots of low-skilled immigrants from South and Central America and some Asian countries. And they're providing all kinds of services uh, to uh, the, the economy. So we get, this way I put it, is we have immigrant doctors and immigrant janitors. And actually, we share that with Britain. Britain is the other country that sort of does this. OK, so with that background, let's go on and talk about how do immigrants affect the labor market. And if I can convince you of one thing today, uh, I hope I can convince you that the first, second line of this slide is wrong. OK, most people, <clears throat> I spent a, a, not that much time, but sometime every week usually end up talking to some journalist. And most journalists, not that I think there's anything wrong with the journalist profession, but most journalists believe that if you have more people, wages will fall. And so to them, it's completely obvious that immigration lowers wages. And you have to go out of your way to explain how that doesn't, isn't really true. So it's completely obvious to them because they're basically Malthusians. They think of the economy the way Malthus did in his 1926 essay. They think of us as working away with one fixed resource, land. And if we have more people, we basically can't do anything about it. We're going to be forced to use lousier and lousier land, or we're going to have more workers per acre. And we're going to end up uh, basically less productive. And so that's the Malthusian trap. Now, <clears throat> on the other hand, larger countries do not have lower incomes on average. Larger cities in the US have higher pay on average, and many countries uh, actually try to promote population. So Canada has recently, actually this morning, announced they're going to raise the number of immigrants they allow in. Australia and New Zealand are actively promoting immigration as well on the theory that they're too small. So how do we square that up? Well, the way we square that up is the idea that was invented by the neoclassicals, uh, which is that if you have capital, okay, you can effectively improve productivity as population grows. So as long as uh, capital can expand with population, we can avoid the Malthusian trap. Now, there is still potentially a shortage of land, and that's an important thing in Henry George's work. However, in the United States, on average, that's not a huge problem. So on average, land rents are not particularly high. They're extremely high in large cities, San Francisco area, uh, New York area, and so on. But on average, that's not a particular issue. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. So today we understand that output depends on labor and capital. And as long as capital can expand, we'll be OK. So what that, how do we think about that mean? What does that mean? It means that when you get an increase in the number of workers in a country, say from an immigration or inflow, the first thing that happens is potentially some downward pressure on wages. But almost immediately, you would expect to see increases in investment. And that increase in investment, if it could be enough to keep the capital labor ratio on track, would offset, largely offset the effect of immigration. And actually, a lot of modern economic models, the so-called modern growth theory, says that size matters in a positive way. So a larger economy is more productive. And my friends in New Zealand all firmly believe that New Zealand would be much better off if it could just be a little bit bigger. And if, if they would, they'd be glad to get bigger if they could just convince people not to all want to live in Auckland. Uh, and they have the same problem as Canada, that basically the country is kind of running north and south, and Auckland is actually at the very nice end 
As you go further south, it gets colder and windier. So everybody wants to be in Auckland. Uh, so what's the historical record on capital labor ratio? Well, let me just show you a quick graph. That's what it looks like. That's the long run trend in capital labor ratio in the United States. Uh, it's been remarkably stable. It was remarkably stable all through the period of the late 90s and early 2000s. This is the period when we had the biggest immigration flows in the US. And so it looks like we were able somehow to put that investment on the ground and keep the capital labor ratio constant. There's a lot of, uh, uh, in the introduction it was mentioned, quasi-experiment or natural experiment kind of analysis. There's one really nice natural experiment to study this, and that's the arrival of all those um, Russian emigres to Israel at the uh, when in the early 1990s, when the Russia finally let uh, Jewish people leave and go to Israel, and so that there was a massive inflow, 40% increase in the population in just a couple of years, and the investment numbers in Israel just bounce up, stay up for about 10 years, and then come back down. So it suggests that uh, that's a, a fairly important uh, method of adoption. Okay. So on average, we're not really expecting immigration to be a huge problem, but there is a potential issue, and I pointed it out when I said, well, immigrants are different in that they are highly concentrated at the bottom and the top. Why does that matter? Well, it could matter because different skill groups may not be doing exactly the same kind of work, and so if you have too many workers in one category, it puts pressure on that category's wages, even though there's an increase in investment. Uh, and so that's an important concern, especially because, uh, uh, as we all know, I think, in the last 30 years in the US, uh, people at the bottom of the distribution have not done as well. So you might be particularly concerned about immigration policy if that policy has, even if it hasn't hurt on average, if it's been particularly negative for people at the bottom of the skill distribution, people would say only uh, 10 or 11 years of call, uh, high school, didn't finish high school, because those guys are doing poorly anyway. And so that's a concern. So what do we know about this? Well, the literature on this is actually surprisingly complicated. Um, there isn't really any direct way to say, OK, you're in skill group one, and you're in skill group two, and you're in skill group three, and I'm going to follow you over time. People move around. They start out at a certain level of uh, skill in their early careers. Hopefully, everyone who graduates with a bachelor's degree, for instance, will be kind of in the 60th percentile or so. But by the time you're 40, let's hope you're going to be, if you've got a bachelor's degree, and maybe do a little bit more education or training, you might make it to the 90 or 95th percentile without too much trouble. And the average would be, say, in the 80th. So there is, uh, it's very difficult to really know. There's pretty much agreement in the literature that there's two major skill groups, at least. And the two major groups, that economists have focused on in most of their work would be what I call the bottom and lower middle. This would be up to around a year or two of college. And the upper middle and top. So that would be sort of three years of college, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, and so on. So if that's the right, agree uh, uh, if that's the right cut, actually, immigrants and natives are not very different. because. Splitting right at the middle, immigrants and natives fall equally. Where they're different is how they fall within these two categories. So immigrants are in the really bottom versus the lower middle. Natives are in the lower middle versus the bottom. Immigrants are in the really top versus the upper middle. Natives are in the upper middle versus the really top. So depending on how you're going to cut the data, you might expect, on average, not much effect, or you might expect negative effects at the very bottom at the very top, and maybe positive effects in the middle. Everybody sort of understand that idea? That's the reasoning that people have. Now, I'm saying it in a very vague way because surprisingly, after all these years of research, there's still not widespread agreement on this. And I'm going to talk about how uh, that works uh, it, it, when I come to summarize some of the most recent uh, evidence on this come from uh, work by uh, an, probably the most famous uh, economist of immigration policy in the United States, George Borjas. And so I'll, pr I'll present some of his analysis and show how this translates out. OK, so what are the evidence? Well, there's really three kinds of evidence on immigration. Uh, the first kind is cross-city comparisons. And this is what strikes me, has always struck me, as the most natural kind of evidence, because we've got enormous variation across cities in how many immigrants there are, and largely, that uh, variation is driven by happenstance and historical patterns. So there's a lot of immigrants 
in Houston. Uh, there's not very many immigrants in Atlanta. Those two cities are, in many ways, similar. And a lot of uh, people who grow up in Atlanta have family in Houston, and vice versa. So there's some connections. But the Hispanic immigrants have mostly come to Houston and not so much to Atlanta. So those two, those two might be a one you would want to compare. Uh, similarly, you can compare uh, lots of cities around the, uh, the country and look at how that pattern has changed. On average, this kind of comparison, excuse me, this kind of comparison suggests two things. First, you find that in cities that have got more immigration, especially more immigration from South America, Central America, Mexico, there's much lower fraction of highly educated workers. So if you were to compare Los Angeles and Boston, or Los Angeles and San Francisco, you see average education in Los Angeles is much lower than average education in San Francisco, and it's because of immigration. Okay, that extra 20% of immigrants in Los Angeles is mostly low educated uh, Hispanic immigrants from Mexico and South Central America, some Asian. So that has lowered, the, or excuse me, increased the relative supply of this bottom education group in a lot of cities. And surprisingly, the relative wages of lowest education natives are not very easily seen to be related to that pattern. And so a lot of work that I've done over the last 20 years has been trying to get to the bottom of this and say, is that really what's going on or are we missing something? And the, the way that I think is most compelling to check whether we're missing something is to try and pull out just the part of the change in uh, immigration to a given city that can be predicted because of the immigrants who were lived there before and circumstances in the sending country. And a really good example of this would be, uh, suppose a problem emerges in Poland. Where are Polish immigrants going to go? Anybody know? No one's from Chicago? They all go to Chicago. OK, so you can tell if something goes bad in Poland, there's going to be an inflow of immigrants to Chicago. Okay, you can take that to the bank. If something goes wrong in the Philippines, there's going to be an inflow to the historical naval base cities in the United States, because there was historically a special provision in US law that said if you work at a naval base and you're from the Philippines, you don't, you're not covered by immigration quotas. So uh, that's why there's a lot of uh, Filipino immigrants in Vallejo, California, although otherwise it's not a particularly attractive city. <laughs> And uh, so that allows you to isolate this uh, sort of historically driven pattern of immigration. Uh, and when I've done that, this is the kind of pattern I've found. So on this axis, it's a little bit hard to interpret the numbers, but on this axis is the relative number of very low educated people, so people with a dropout education, versus high school. Remember, we're most concerned about that very low bottom. Uh, people with less than, um, less than high school education. So this is the relative change in the city's ratio of dropouts to high school graduates that's driven by this inflow of immigration over the last 20 years. And it's going over a very wide range because we're going from places in the Texas border to places in uh, the Midwest, which have basically had immigrants in the 1880s and 1890s, and no one's gone there since. So uh, that's a very big, wide range of pattern. And on this axis, I'm showing an adjusted differential for natives only between high school and dropout workers. Okay? And if you thought that there was a big problem as you get more immigrants coming in that are increasing the relative number of people in the bottom, you would think that that would drive this wage down. And you can see that there's not any evidence of that. So that's always been a surprise, but I'm fairly confident that you could reanalyze the data tomorrow, keep reanalyzing it, and you would find that pattern. OK. Another kind of evidence uh, is what I would call a big shock. And I wrote a paper on this a long, long time ago on the Mariel Boatlift. Um, the Mariel Boatlift was very interesting because in the course of a few months, 70,000 workers, 150,000 people total, 70,000 workers, were sort of dropped into Miami. Uh, and that arose because of political developments in Cuba. And that I concluded in my analysis of the, of the boat lift that it didn't have any large effect on uh, native workers in Miami, in particular on um, African Americans in Cuba, or in, in Miami, which are 
particularly disadvantaged group. And Miami is not a high-wage city anyway, and that, that particular group uh, is a group that you might think might be displaced when uh, the Mariolitos come to town because many of the bosses and the small businesses in Miami are owned by Cubans. And so they would sort of say, well, my cousin just showed up on the boat. I mean, everybody's seen the movie. My cousin just showed up on the boat, so I'm going to you know, fire you and hire him. And that might have had a negative effect, particularly on African Americans. So I, I thought that was pretty compelling. Um, this is a, a recent reanalysis of that experience. You may know that there's become controversial again. Um, this was done by uh, Giovanni Perry at University of California, Davis. Uh, and what he's done is he's shown trends in the real wages of uh, people in Miami. Miami is the solid line. And what he calls synthetic Miami. So this is an idea that has been developed over the last 20 years where you're trying to compare Miami. When, when we did our famous study of the minimum wage, we said, well, we want to compare New Jersey to synthetic New Jersey, i.e., the part of Pennsylvania right on the border. Now, that wasn't the greatest idea, probably, because <laughs> they're not exactly the same. This method says, I want to compare Miami to a bunch of other cities. I'm going to choose cities such that when I put them together, they track Miami really well in the years before the boat lift occurred. And you can see that's going on. So the Miami and the synthetic Miami have the same trend beforehand. And they have more or less the same trend after. So this analysis suggests that this Miami, the Marriott boat lift didn't have much of an effect. Um, similar evidence has been assembled for the, Portugal, the end of the Angola colonial war, France, the end of the Algerian war, and Israel with the, as I mentioned, the lifting of immigration. So this kind of big shock thing also suggests not much evidence. OK. Now, the third kind of evidence is the kind of evidence that is pretty widely discussed in economics. Uh, and this is model-based analysis. Uh, model-based analysis means that you develop a model, how wages are determined, between supply and demand. You then take the actual supplies that have arisen of different immigrant groups, and you run it through the model, and you say, what happened to wages? Okay, and you do this at the national level. And I'm the leading exponent of this uh, uh, approach is George Borjas. So I'll, I'll use some uh, evidence from his most recent book, which is a very um, scholarly study of immigration. Now, George and I disagree, I would say, on sort of the general tone about immigration. But I don't disagree with what's in, his, in this book so on, on these calculations. So I'm going to show you what those things are. There is some disagreement in this literature about how you di divide up the skill groups. And I'm going to show you how that matters. It doesn't matter very much, but it matters a little bit. And the big questions in the literature are, do we think that immigrants and natives with exactly the same education credentials are the same? Or do we think that employers treat them a little bit differently? If you think that employers treat them a little bit differently, it moves the competition effect of immigration away from natives and toward previous immigrants. If you think they're exactly the same, it unloads all of that competition directly on natives and immigrants as a whole. So depending on how you feel about that, that's a parameter in these models. That, that will make a difference. And so let me just show you George's calculations. So this is his analysis of the effect of immigration from 1990 to 2010. So that's a, a 20 years of very high immigration, in the late eight, 1990s in particular, very high. He's divided the education categories into five, high school dropouts, high school grads, some college, BA, postgrads. We've seen those categories before. And the last column is all native men. And his preferred specification is the first row. So this is the one where he assumes that immigrant and natives with the same education credentials are treated the same by employers. And his analysis suggests that immigration has had a three percentage point negative effect on dropout men. Okay? And you can see across the board, not much else. Now, these are models. So this is a calculation based on that model and the actual immigrant group that, uh, that we got. My preferred alternative would assume that immigrants and natives are slightly imperfect substitutes, and that's going to have this impact and raise the other numbers a little bit. It means that, on average, natives benefit slightly from immigration. But you can see there's really not much distance between these two calculations. So if you think of one way to think about this, George is a pretty harsh critic of immigration. And this is sort of his overall summary of the, the wage effects. So it's not a very large effect. It's concentrated largely on this very bottom group, a little bit negative for the postgrads. We're not too worried about the postgrads. 
We need more postgrads. Their wages have risen a lot. This says they wouldn't have risen quite as much. We're more worried about this bottom group. So if you're someone who's most worried about immigration, in particular the lowest group, which I think is completely fair and consistent with Jesuit principles and, and all of that, uh, then you might say, well, that's something that on that, over that 20-year uh, period, that group's real wages fell about 15 percentage points. So this contributed three of those 15 percentage points, according to this calculation. So that's, that's where we are in this, uh, I think, on this literature. All right. So my view is that the evidence, this is not evidence. This is a model calculation. So my view is that the evidence doesn't show much. Uh, and a calculation done by someone who's deeply skeptical of immigration doesn't show too much. Maybe a little bit of negative effect at the very bottom makes some sec sense economically. So I think that's what we, where we are in terms of the economic impacts of immigration on natives. OK. So last thing, uh, it was just a few minutes to go. OK, how should we understand attitudes to immigration? If it's really true that the, the effects of immigration on native wages are small, uh, what, what's the concern? Moreover, we know that many firms and households use immigrant labor quite intensively. Okay, so many uh, people, I'm, I'm sure many uh, elderly people in the community around Scranton rely on, on immigrants both for, for example, their doctor, for maybe the nurse in their uh, physiotherapy, uh, as well as for the person who comes in and gives them assistance. So many old people are helped, many young people are helped, many businesses, agriculture, construction, and so on. So you might say, well, I can kind of see evidence that there's benefits to immigration. It's, it's filling some gaps in literature. <laughs> Nevertheless, many natives are opposed, or at best, deeply ambivalent. Deeply ambivalent is kind of like, I can't tell you who I'm going to vote for because I still don't know. And I kind of wonder, like, how many more <laughs> months do we going to have to listen to the ads? OK. Uh, anyway, so here's a resolution. So I, I was talking about this problem for a long time with my uh, friend Christian Dussman at University College London uh, and our, uh, another friend, Ian Preston, at UCL in, in London as well. And we kind of had this idea that maybe the reason we're not really thinking about this right is because people care about more than just economics. So people care about the direct effects of immigration on their wages and taxes and also on what we call euphemistically the compositional effects. And what we mean by that is that they look around and see neighbors, coworkers, uh, their daughter's boyfriend, um, uh, schoolmates for their children who are not uh, exactly like them. A different race group, different religious group, uh, different linguistic uh, background. And we know from a lot of research on, for example, where people choose to send their children to school, that those concerns are extremely important drivers. So I've done research, and others, many others have done many, many decades of research on, for example, what neighborhood you choose to live in and how that's affected by arrivals of minority people in the neighborhood. And there's strong evidence that many, many natives in the United States, for example, many whites in the United States, get nervous when their neighborhood goes beyond 10 or so percent uh, minority. Basically, they start looking around for another neighborhood. If that's true, then it suggests that people are thinking about both of these features when they're thinking about immigration. And they so we, we thought about asking them a set of questions to try and elicit both these channels. Here's the questions we asked. And this is a survey we did in the, uh, all the EU countries in the first wave of the European Social Survey. So we asked a series of 10 questions, five on kind of economics and five on the compositional things. And you can see the tenor of these. When you ask somebody, well, how does immigration affect economics, we're not expecting a treatise. Okay? We're expecting, we have to ask the questions in ways that would be salient for a typical person in the survey. So we thought, well, do you agree that they uh, lower wages, harm the poor, fill job shortages, take away jobs, or create new jobs, take out more than they put in in taxes? And you put all those five things together, they're pretty systematic, people who feel that kind of one way on one of those questions is going to feel kind of consistent with that on the other. And you can rank people in, a, in kind, of, kind of categories based on how much they feel uh, about the economic, the negative or positive uh, impacts of, of immigration on, on, on the economy and the labor market. And then here's the other set of questions. Now, we had, we had to fight a lot with the survey specialists uh, on how to ask these questions because you can't ask questions that uh, sort of deeply ask you, are you prejudiced against people? Or are you, you, know, are you a racist? Or you know, 
So here's what we came up with as a set of questions in collaboration with the ESS survey people. So do you agree or better or disagree it's better if everyone shares the same customs and traditions, shares the same religion, shares the same language? Do you think that immigrants undermine or enrich the culture of a country? And do you think that you should stop immigration to reduce social tensions? Now, I actually kind of like these questions. And I was reviewing this. I hadn't really thought about this paper for a number of years. This paper's a little bit old. It's like four or five years old. And I was thinking about these questions. I thought, you know, we should take these to people and when they're asked about their views about immigration in the United States these days. Because I think these capture an issue that people are concerned about, uh, and many people. Uh, anyway, so what we did, we put these together. And then we asked each person, OK, how do you feel about immigration to the EU or your country? Do you think we should have more or less? Just ask them that simple question. Then we asked them um, uh, some other questions. And we, we said, well, which of these two general channels drives your attitudes? And what we found is that across all the European countries, and the European countries are quite different. Sweden and Norway are very pro-immigrant on average. Uh, Greece is very anti-immigrant on average. Uh, Italy is sort of in between. Britain and France are sort of in between. So there's quite a wide range. But in all cases, in all those countries, it was sort of a 20-80 split. 20% economics, 80% this compositional concern. So and in particular, we found that older rural and non-college grad people were most concerned about not the economics of immigration, but about these compositional issues. So we thought that this gave some pretty good insight, not only into the average, but also we know that those groups are the ones who are most negative about immigration. And it seems to us like it's not really that much about immigration, maybe 20% about, about economics. It's 80% about these other features. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind. So uh, overall, I think that the economics of immigration is an interesting and challenging field. Uh, I've been glad to contribute to it over the years. I'm glad to tell you about it. Uh, I think that we've got some pretty good findings. I think that, for example, uh, George Borges and I would be considered um, kind of at opposite ends of, of, in some people's minds of the spectrum. And yet, I think we would probably agree, uh, I would certainly agree with, with George's summary of the model-based estimates, that they don't suggest large effects. If there is a, an effect of immigration, it's a relatively modest effect concentrated in this bottom group. That is, in fact, you know, we must recognize that's a group that's been disadvantaged by economic trends. And so there is a legitimate concern about that group. Uh, and I think you could fairly walk away and say, based on that, I feel there is a, an economic concern. Uh, but actually, my view is the economics of immigration doesn't give much insight into why people think differently about immigration. In fact, it's this other, more sociological phenomenon. And so we as economists, or we as uh, uh, economically literate, uh, citizens should be thinking about those features of immigration and say, OK, I don't agree with that view, but I think that there would be something we could do to try and uh, make people feel differently, or I agree with that view, and I'm happy to go along with it. But I think that the ec uh, emphasis, continued longstanding emphasis on the economics of, it, of um, immigration is, at least the economics of immigration impacts, is probably missing the point. So I'm here to tell you that you probably could have saved a lot of time by going to my last slide. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. I'm glad to take it. So um, actually, there's a, um, that phenomenon is occurring around the world. Uh, Japan is already on the front edge of that. They've got huge problems with declining population and much older population than us. Um, my view is, and, and they are very strong in their position. They do not want immigration. right? So my view is it's technically feasible to solve that problem. If you really don't want immigration, you can devise robots 
to, they have robots to give uh, older people a bath. Apparently it's really something. Uh, <laughs> so you really can do it. It's going to be very costly and it's going to involve a lot of taxation on the younger generation. But it can be done. Whether it's worth it, I think, really depends on your view. How much would you really not want to be part of a country which is no longer you know, Japanese? And actually, many of the Asian countries have the same problem. Korea has the same problem. China is going to encounter it an even more quickly and even faster drop off, because they had this very sharp demographic drop. Uh, and so uh, my view is that that's a, an example of an economic effect of immigration. You're, you're really thinking about uh, bigger is better. Like a bigger economy, a growing economy is, is a more easily thing, easy to run, thing to run. And historically, human societies have all gone up. Right? It's a little bit hard to imagine a human society where we look around and say, OK, next year we're going to be smaller, and the year after that smaller, and the year after that smaller. It doesn't fit with our conception, uh, especially uh, you know, those of us in North America who grew up with the Wild West and you know, big ranges and bigger car next year and the new model Cadillac and everything. So I think it actually, uh, it's technically feasible and you know, anything can be done, but it is a co I think it's a cost. Yeah. One comment. Uh, the, the students reading, did they know that we're providing them free beer? <laughs> <laughs> Is there free beer out there? <laughs> <laughs> so, the serious question, uh, you talk about undocumented immigrants. In your research, is that number roughly 25%? the same in Canada or in Europe, but I'm, I'm really interested in why you seem to have so many undocumented immigrants. Um, so, well, as usual in economics, uh, the, what we know about each country is, is different. Okay, so we have pretty good information on the U.S. because uh, many demographers have spent their lives trying to count this. There's a guy named Jeff Passell at the at Pew Hispanic Institute who spent 20 years, carefully going over birth records, death records, immigration records, and getting estimates, and developing a methodology to validate it. We know a lot less about other countries, to tell you the honest truth, in part because we don't have any Jeff Passells in those other countries. Uh, it's generally believed that the fraction of uh, undocumented immigrants in, in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand is quite low, on the order of a couple of percents. They would all be clustered in Toronto and Vancouver, probably, and in, in, in Canada, and uh, in Melbourne and Sydney and Australia. And, Auckland and, and New Zealand. So it might be a few more percents in those labor markets. Um, in Europe, it's really an unknown factor. No one knows how many immer illegal immigrants there are in, uh, say, Italy. It's believed that below Naples, it's very high. Because it, Italy has a large underground sector, even for the natives. <laughs> below Naples, there's you know, at least 30% of the workforce is uh, not on any recorded job. So it's pretty easy when you've got that big underground sector to hide a few, few immigrants in there. So it's thought that we're at the high end, but it's not known for sure, I think. I wouldn't be surprised if some southern European countries are in the 10s or 20s, especially in certain regions of the country. But US is, is quite high. Yeah. Uh, by way of context, in, uh, you know, in, until 1920, there wasn't a such thing as undocumented immigrant. You just showed up. So, you know, in some sense, we always had a much more, okay, you showed up. I mean, you had to do your TB test or whatever, and if you got through that, you're in. Right? So, we've had, we had a long history of just welcome, you know, come on in. Yeah, so, um, so the EU is facing a very difficult problem, which is mass migration from Africa and Middle East through Greece and uh, into the rest of Europe. And so last year, uh, more than a million people came to Germany alone and several hundred thousand to other countries in the EU. And uh, so that's a fairly large inflow for their, their size, rather uncontrolled. And, uh, the absence of control of the overall system, so the EU, think of the EU as a big you know, glob with a, some kind of boundary around the outside, and, and 
people who are anti-EU uh, immigration policy characterize it as there's a big hole over here, and then they're all going to go over here. So the people who were uh, pro-Brexit, I think, felt that British had no control of their immigration policy because once you're inside the EU, the EU rules said you could come once you were accepted. So someone who came as a Syrian refugee to uh, Germany and got legal documentation papers for Germany could then move to, to, to England. And that, that thought was uh, you know, making a lot of uh, British voters apparently quite nervous. Um, now we kind of have a version of that in that we don't have a state level immigration policy. So if you're a state that feels like you're relatively crowded or the people in that state really have stronger preferences against these compositional issues, you don't have any way to prevent it. So uh, certainly there are parts of California, Southern California, very historically very conservative parts of California where that would have been a, an issue. They would say, you know, we don't want to have all these immigrants come to our neighborhoods. Uh, so that you have a similar issue in the U.S. Um, but I think the, 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 the refugee crisis and the Syrian refugee crisis and or related crisis in, in uh, Europe kind of crystallized all of those concerns. Yeah. So it, it is a, obviously a huge concern. And I think they're going to have decades of problems straightening it out. So most, uh, say, construction jobs, the, the construction firm itself would have hired a subcontractor. And so the, as far as the construction company is concerned, they've hired legitimately certified workers. Now, it's a bit of a fiction because, you know, obviously people know they must be some, you know, the drywall team is actually largely illegal. But the, 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 the fiction is that, that, that they're illegal. And so as far as uh, large employers in that sector are concerned, they're, they've got you know, they're not actually directly hiring illegals. And they're paying them above minimum wage, and they're providing the same benefits. Now, my feeling is that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're kind of a, a country which has gotten used to having cheap labor. And uh, we don't have that many young workers anymore. People in high school don't work. You know, teenage employment rate is very low. Uh, lots and lots of people, there's only 10% of our native population are dropouts, so there really aren't that many unskilled natives. And they're distributed in different areas. So I think that you know, we could possibly adapt to that by having much higher wages for low-skilled workers. And if one way to think about this, actually, is very interesting. The same thing as, as cutting off illegal immigration and, and low-skilled immigration flows is in many ways similar as a high minimum wage. It raises the cost of labor. And if you had a high minimum wage that was enforced, it would prevent hiring of um, workers that couldn't have that level of productivity. And so it might curtail the demand for low-skilled workers. But my view is employers are, uh, so for example, consider a, a fruit strawberry farm in, in Castro Valley in California. They have a certain product they can sell. And if they can get the uh, pick by hand at a certain price, they can be in business. If they can't, they're actually going to produce the strawberries in uh, Mexico. And so they're competing on that market, and they need that low-wage labor to stay active. And this is a part, I think, that Henry George would have liked. One of the main effects of this uh, of low-wage immigration, uh, of a lot of low-skilled immigration available for the agriculture sector, is high land prices in the Central Valley of California. So uh, large landowners are actually somewhat better off by this. And they create a pretty strong lobby to keep that, that going. I mean, they're, you know. For whatever you may think about immigration, plus or minus, there's just no doubt that that's true. So I think it's, it's basically employers have a, a lot of competition. And they've got channels to use low-skilled labor. They've got the technology. They know how to do it. You're building a house uh, you know, in a big subdivision. You can actually put together a team of guys that don't have much training, and they can drywall that house, do a pretty good job. So you can use very low-skilled workers to do it. That's not the way they build a house in Germany, but you could do it here. So that, that's what I mean. It's kind of an adaption. I have a question. Uh, speaking of Germany, since uh, in Germany the population growth is expected to go down, right? Yeah. Uh, 
not immigrants, well, legal or illegal, it, it's a different purpose of if you're forced to leave your country because you fear your life is in danger or you're forced to leave for other reasons, just no economic reasons. Uh, <coughs> and gee, the effect can be kind of, kind of different of what you put uh, in your findings in the sense that uh, a lot of automakers, for example, in Germany, they are absorbing or they are willing to take these refugees because they are already trained, let's say they are mechanics or they uh, they are not like law school let's say. So they can take the <coughs> opportunity to, you know, be more efficient and more productive, and that affects growth as well. So in that case, we should expect the the wages, the wage effect to be kind of positive in the future. So for that, you know, for that reason, I see. For that purpose. Uh, 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 yeah. A kind of like Greece. Oh yeah, I, I didn't mean to. Um, I should. I shouldn't have used the Greek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I, yeah. I want to comment on that as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah
and say, well, we think the effects are the same for women, but we don't want to get into the fact that women work part time and we can't adjust for that and so on. Nowadays, in economics, to our credit, I think we finally got on the bandwagon. We realized we have to analyze women and men separately. And so there's not that much direct research which has tried to say, is there a big difference between the effects for men and women? To the best of my knowledge, it tends to show that the work that I've done like that shows that the effects are about the same. So there are, uh, you know, on average, there's about the same number of female Im immigrants as a male. Um, uh, yes, yes. Now, female immigrants don't work quite as much as native. Uh, females. So they're a little bit less of a labor supply shock. They have a little bit higher rate of non-work, especially the low-skilled ones. So, but, but they've also caught up quite a bit, so it's not too different, as far as I know. Um, yeah, so Miami, uh, the work that I did, and this was some time ago, the r work I showed you here is actually new work that's been done by Giovanni uh, Perry. Um, so the work that I did was really focusing on the period between 1980 and 1985, which is the first five years that the Marialitos are there. And at that time, Miami, relative to these other synthetic Miami cities, had a little bit more unskilled labor force. It had more workers in uh, certain low-wage sectors, in particular restaurants, hotels, and, and apparel manufacturing, actually, back then. Uh, and so they were a city. It was, it's always been a relatively lower-wage city, and it's a city that had sort of specialized in tourism and industries like that that can more readily absorb low-skilled workers. So I think. Um, in terms of, I, I, didn't, I don't remember, but I don't think I did anything in particular about the high end. I remember thinking and, and showing in my research that the, um, at the low end, the Miami market was, in some sense, well adopted to take the Mariolitos, in part because they had accepted the, the first wave of Cuban immigrants in 1960 and 61, 59, 60, 61. So there was already a long tradition. And they, you know, subsequent to that, the Nicaraguans came there. Uh, Salvadorans and so on. So, you know, and if you want to meet a South American, you go to Miami, basically. And so it's, it's always been, you know, a port of entry. So I think it's well adopted. I don't know in terms of, like, if we looked at the banking sector, if it hires, like, relatively low-skilled tellers or something. I don't know the answer to that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little different than other cities, but that, that's all I know. Other questions? Yes. Right. So I, I got this question earlier today, actually. Um, I've tried all my career not to say what my opinion is on policy pronouncements directly. I can tell you what my good friend Alan Kruger's opinion is. How about that? <laughs> so Alan's view is, I think, that um, uh, raising the minimum wage at so, to some level is a good idea on average. May have some costs, but would be over, overridden by benefits. I think Alan is very nervous about 15 or so dollars an hour, and he thinks someplace earlier than that. And I think he's on the record for that. I think he wrote an article, an op-ed piece on that, to that account. Um, and I think that his reasoning makes some sense to me, so I can definitely see that. Um, that, that, so that. I think it's a concern, because the reason why he's concerned, and I think this is a legitimate concern, is that's a range that's outside of our historical experience. $12 or in that range is kind of at the, more like where we were in the late 70s. Uh, and it, we've been you know, closer to that in the past and without apparently huge problems. So I think Alan felt like on the basis of the track record from these experiments in the past, you could be a bit more confident that that wasn't going to be hugely problematic. Uh, and so I think that, that's, you know, that's a, you've got to ask when you're trying to use these natural experiment type evidence, you say, well, it's kind of like if I said I studied a drug and I gave a dose of 10 and that was good, 
and somebody says, well, let's give a dose of 20. You know, that might be too much. Okay, we can take one more question. Last question. Yes, Jordan. Hi. So you have this breakdown that Europeans view it uh, 20% from the economic and 80% from the population. Have you found that this holds constant in policy of Europe, where it's 20% 20, 20 based on economic reasons and 80% population? So what we did was we got, we asked those 10 questions, and then a bunch of other questions like that were sort of, of the, something like the following. Do you think that immigration from um, uh, former Soviet republics should be increased or reduced? Do you think that immigration from African countries should be Im increased or reduced? Do you think that immigration from South America should be increased or reduced? And what we found was that, that those questions, all of them were kind of in this 2080 range, fairly comparable. And so that's, that's what I meant. That, we didn't do much more than that. Okay, well, Professor uh, Cart, this was a very informative and enjoyable lecture. Let's put our hands together. For Professor Hart. <laughs> this concludes our uh, 31st annual Henninger Lecture. Uh, we hope to see you again next year. Have a good uh, evening.